We're going to be in Exodus chapter 2. I know we've, we've gone over this land, but we're going to come back as an excursus, so to speak. Talk about a mother's heart, Jochebed to Jesus is the title of the sermon from Exodus 2, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Jochebed to Jesus, a mother's heart. Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, it reads, Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for about three months. But Verse 3, but when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Verse 5, then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds. She sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw a baby, and she was crying, or the baby was crying, and so she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Verse 7, then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to the mother, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. Verse 10, When the child grew older, he took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and the, he became his son. her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Now this is familiar territory because we just went over this, but I thought we would take a little bit of time uh, kind of diving into it. Obviously, today's Mother's Day, and I'm so grateful for my own mom. It was the foundation of my own faith. And so we rightfully and joyfully celebrate women because they're made in the image of God and they're co-heirs with us of the salvation, the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen? We're completely equal at the foot of the cross and completely just like the rest of us when it comes to righteousness through Jesus Christ. And so today we celebrate the unique, the divinely ordained office of motherhood, that gifting that's given to women and not to men. Now, not all women choose the grace of motherhood. We kind of know this, right? We kind of know that some women don't. And I remember an old uh, illustration that was told to me by another pastor about two women, a mother and a daughter, going into a department store looking for clothes. And the younger one, the adult daughter, was trying on swimsuits. And after 10, 12, 15 of them not working out, not fitting right, you could hear her frustration to which the older Woman, her mother said, look, honey, which would you rather have? A loving, doting husband and three precious children or a swimsuit that fits? To which a woman from another stall screamed out, a swimsuit that fits, <laughs> right? And so not all women are born natural mothers and not all women choose motherhood, but motherhood is a blessing among us. And in our culture today, it's becoming a shrinking occupation, a shrinking calling, as more and more women are choosing not to be mothers. And this is causing serious sociopolitical issues around the world. Add to this the reality that one in five couples in the United States, that's 20%, are infertile, and that some precious young ladies simply decide because of that they can't be mothers. And, and you know what? That, that's nothing... Nothing they can do about that. God's grace will have to backfill that, and they're precious women just the same as everybody else. But then you see many, many other women that are young without biological issues choosing to delay marriage. That is the thing that's going into the future, is the delaying of marriage, the delaying of couplehood, and the delaying of having children. And ultimately, they run into a whole host of problems by having children or later or by not having them at all. In fact, this is such a big issue that most Western cultures around the world are seeing plunging birth rates. I read an article this week about the Prime Minister of, of Japan, I think his name's Abe, and he was speaking in a public forum about how women, Japanese women, needed, whether they're married or not, to have three children each for their society and culture to continue because they see such a plunging birth rate as most Japanese women are choosing not to marry, not to have children, and to be career women, that literally the fabric of Japan could come unraveled and that culture could cease to exist. 
Now, what do you think happened when he said those remarks publicly? In our Me Too, right, movement culture, he took a hammering. He took a beating. Now, he tried to clarify those remarks and say he wasn't trying to tell women what to do. He was just trying to say, literally, our culture that we love as Japanese will not exist. It will not be around if we do not start having more children. We see this in a lot of different Western societies. As the birth rate goes down, France, France on average, the couple in France has 1.4 children, while their Muslim French counterparts have on average four children. So literally sociologists are saying France within four decades, I'm sorry, four generations, will be a Muslim country. It will move from French to Arabic in its heritage. It'll move from Catholicism to Islam in its religion. It will change the entire fabric of that culture because of women choosing not to be mothers. Obviously, motherhood really matters. England is seeing the same kind of thing, and we just see this all across the board. Motherhood is such a big deal that the founding general of our nation, George Washington, said, in all his success, remember, they made him the president first, and then they gave him a second to him. And they tried to make him king. They wanted to make him King George. And he said, you know what? We just got done throwing off the tyranny of King George of England. I'm not going to be a king. So they said, well, will you do a third term as president? And he refused. And he said, all my success, everything that I owe is to my mother. Even closer to home, Demarius Thomas, the wide receiver, all pro, multiple time for the Denver Broncos, just a couple years ago, if you follow the Denver Broncos at all, he had a horrible couple seasons. And he attributed that to the fact that his mother was still serving a long sentence for drug charges that went on, I think it was close to 20 years. And as soon as she was released, his game literally went up by leaps and bounds. Motherhood matters. It has a huge impact on each and every one of us. So what does motherhood look like, right? What's motherhood? Real mothers would like to be able, just think about this, to eat a whole candy bar all by themselves and drink a Coke without any floaties in it. Does that sound familiar, right? Real mothers would like five minutes in the bathroom alone without five tiny fingers reaching into the door and screaming for her attention or teens barging in on her privacy demanding what they want, right? That's motherhood. Real mothers know that their kitchen utensils are probably going to end up in the sandbox or being used to fix the, lo fix the local motorcycle, right? Real mothers often have sticky floors, dirty laundry, filthy ovens, but happy husbands and kids. Isn't that true? Real mothers know that dried Play-Doh doesn't come out of shag carpets, <laughs> that red dye doesn't come off countertops, and that those countertops will always have leftover cereal crumbs with milk droplets on them as long as they have kids in the house. That is certainly true. Lights will be left on, toilet paper will not be replaced, and that's the life of a mother. Real mothers sometimes ask, why me? And then they get that perfect little voice that says, because in my life, you're the best mom, right? Real mothers know that a child's growth is not measured by height or years or grades. Real growth in a child is measured by how close that child matches your values and walks with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is marked by the progression of a mama becoming a mom to becoming a mother. Real motherhood is what the, the truth that the Greeks understood, that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. They understood this and they lived it. In fact, Alexander the Great, as brutal of a dictator he was, conquering the entire known world, he said the only person that he ever loved and cared about in his life was his mom even though he was the prince of the king. Mothers are an integral part of our lives. And so we move on into the book of Exodus, and we see the case of Jochebed. And in her life, we see that she is a godly mother. She's a mother that made a huge difference. Okay, so what I want you to think about just for a second is, because of the characteristics that we're going to look at in her life today, the nation of Israel continues to exist in the Middle East. And Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, came upon this earth, lived a life, and died on the cross, was buried and resurrected. If Jochebed had not been obedient, then we would not be gathering here today to call ourselves Christian, because there would have been no Jesus. And the nation of Israel wouldn't be in it with Iran, because they wouldn't exist. 
So let's go ahead and look at this. The first thing I want you to look at is this. Jochebed was a mother of courage, right? In verses 1 and 2, we kind of see this where it says, Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. It's very interesting that when we look at the life of Jochebed in greater detail, because we've talked about her before, it never mentions her name, and it never mentions her husband's name here. It just says what? It says that they are of the tribe of Levi, that they're Levites. So you've got to ask yourself, what is the significance of this? Well, Numbers 26, 59 and Exodus 6, 20 identify the parents as Amran, the husband, and Jochebed, the mother, right? And they're both of the tribe of Levi. Why is that important? Because if you know your Bibles well, later on in Exodus, just a few chapters down the road, you're going to see that, that the Levites, after the golden calf incident, they're the ones that are obedient. And you're going to see that God chooses the Levites in Exodus 28, verses 1 through 4, to be the eternal priests for him until Jesus Christ. They're, they're going to be the priests upon this earth until Jesus Christ comes. That they're going to be the people in the tabernacle. They're going to be the people in the temple. They're going to be the mediators between God's people and him. So Moses fits into that line where Moses is going to be a Levite too. And he's going to act as a priest, a mediator between God and his people. That's why it's significant. Now when we look at her, we say, And she, verse 2, became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And when she saw that it was a fine child or a healthy child or a beautiful child, there's different translations, she hid him for three months. Now this woman had great courage. Just think about this. This woman lived in a culture much like our own. She lived in a culture of death. I don't know if you ever think about that when you think about, you know, the great story of Moses and all this. But Jochebed and Moses existed in a culture just like our own, a culture of death. That was norm. The pagan cultures like Egypt sacrificed their children to their gods through bloodletting and through fire. Now just think about that. To please their pagan gods, they offered up their own children to them as sacrifices, living sacrifices. So when it came time to offer up the children of the Hebrews, it was easy for Pharaoh. As he saw the growing number of strong slaves that would keep increasing due to, chapter 1 tells us, God's blessing and his providence and those kinds of things, it was easy for him to throw the Hebrew boys under the bus, right? To send them to their deaths in the Nile. No problem. In fact, it was kind of pleasant for him to think about this in his mind. A culture of death. The, the law of Pharaoh that says every baby boy that is born is to be killed and thrown into the Nile. In fact, the Nile River was a god for the Egyptians. And so literally, he was sacrificing the Hebrew boys to his river god. He was kind of getting a two-four, get rid of his potential enemies, keeping his slaves, the women, and sacrificing to his river god. This was a big deal. It's no big deal at all for Pharaoh to go ahead and do this out of sight, out of mind. But Jochebed was courageous. She could have simply obeyed Pharaoh, and what would have happened to her? Nothing. Life would have been good. It would have been easy. If you do what Pharaoh says... The whip doesn't come and the beatings don't come and you don't get put to the sword. And in this culture of death, under Pharaoh's watchful eye and his troops and all the guys, the slave drivers over them, Jochebed chooses courageously to go ahead and give birth to the son and to hide him for three months. This is not a small thing. She is choosing to do the very thing that could get her and her family killed by going against the king's edict. But like so many people today, the good mothers, she provides and she protects Moses, and she does what is necessary. Jochebed demonstrates that she's a woman of courage. She's a woman that believes that she can rely upon God to try to hide her baby that she's expecting from the watchful eyes of the Egyptians. Now think about the pragmatics of this. When you look at this text, it's not that simple. We just kind of passed over it. As a woman grows with a baby inside of her, at some point, for most women, it's hard to hide. True? In the eighth, ninth month, and the Egyptians are going to see her, and they're going to take notice, and they're going to start hovering for when that baby drops. And this woman 
relying upon God, believing in her God. She is courageous, and she does the very thing that she can do, which is she hides him. She nurses him. She protects him. I have often thought as I was meditating on this passage, what did she have to do to keep that little baby quiet? Now, under three months of age, all our kids, you know, most of the time they're quiet. But Greg had colic. He screamed all the time. How do you keep them quiet? How do you keep them quiet? She nursed. She coddled. She rocked. She loved. She kept him close. She did whatever it took to keep him alive. She protected and she provided. And she relied upon her God to take care of her needs. She was courageous. And her husband was pretty gutsy too to go against the establishment. She did what all mothers do throughout life, throughout history. Good mothers sacrifice for their children. How many of you read a book called The Diary of Anne Frank sometime in your life in school? The Diary of Anne Frank is the story of a family a Jewish family that was hidden in the Netherlands behind a wall, a false wall, actually a bookcase, and it opened in this, and they had a little tiny uh, cubbyhole place that the, the family was hidden in, and they were hidden from the invading Nazis. Well, eventually, if you know much about the story, eventually the Nazis came onto them and found them, and they were arrested, and they were taken out of the home, and they were placed, they were separated. Father Otto went in one train, Mom, Edith, Margot, the sister, and Anne onto another train. And guess where they ended up by train? In Auschwitz. The worst, the most grueling, the most gruesome of the concentration camps of the Nazis. Head shaved, d stripped, mistreated, and sent in for hard labor. And eventually, by being starved and worked so hard, they, they begin to have their bodies break down. And it is recorded that they got scabies and typhus these horrible diseases. And so they were sent to the infirmary, which really was a rat and bug infested, cramped quartered, no lights, completely dark kind of shed that they put all these people in that were dying. They didn't want them to live. Edith, the mom, her ration of bread that she got every day and her water, she would act like she was eating it and then she would hide it and move it through a hole in the floor to feed her two daughters. Eventually, she sacrificed to the point that she starved herself to death to make sure that Anne and Margot lived. That's the essence of a good mother, that you do sacrifice whatever it takes. In this culture, this, this culture of death of Egypt, this culture of death that we live in, good mothers are courageous. They go against the culture. And today we live in a cesspool of a culture of death. Listen to these figures. Belgium passed a law allowing children to be allowed physician-assisted suicide. In 2012, 1,432 Belgians were euthanized. That was a 25% increase over 2011. In one year, the, the numbers were jacked up 25%. Continue on. Now Belgium's having physicians assist children as young as three and four and five, to die as long as the physician thinks that it's right, even against whose opinion? The parents. So I was looking this up. England just had two cases where the parents had a baby boy that was born, the guard family. They had a baby boy that was born without a particular enzyme in his mitochondria, and it's hard for him to live. There was one physician in the world in the United States that has cutting-edge technology that's been proven in research that hasn't been tried on humans yet, and they wanted him to be taken out of England, brought to the United States, and to be treated. It became a big public fiasco, a big PR issue for Britain because the physician said, no, he isn't going to make it, let him go. And so they went to the courts, and the courts judged in favor of the state, and the state put that baby boy to death against mom and dad's wishes as they watched. Now, there's been a few, two, three, four, five cases like this in England. And if you think that that's over there, I'm telling you right now, from following this stuff, it's coming here. The United States is moving in this direction. We already withhold treatment from the elderly and aged because if, they're, if they meet a certain time frame in their life, they've met their developmental life cycle, and then we just let whatever disease take them. 
We're already progressively euthanizing older people as it is. And now it's moving towards children. What about our abortion rates? I was looking this up. One in four women have had an abortion by the age of 45 in our nation. This is pretty tough stuff. Now, there are a lot of things that women get into and a lot of difficult situations, and men are a big part of this, and we're a big cause of this. This is not a women's issue alone. This is a man's issue, too, and we have a big piece in that. But one in four women having an abortion by the age of 45 has totaled since Roe versus Wade 51 million of our own citizens before they were ever born that we've killed by design medically. Now, does that sound like a healthy culture? No. We're not talking about a woman's life being at jeopardy. We're talking about people choosing by convenience and comfort to get rid of their children, both men and women. That is a culture of death. And so when women decide to have their children, when women find out that, hey, maybe my kid's going to have a problem and I've heard about this genetically, but I choose life and I choose to see what God's going to do with that child and they have them anyhow, we should applaud them and just sing their praises, right? This is a big deal in our culture. It is a big deal. We don't get rid of the disabled. We don't get rid of the genetically modified. We don't get rid of... That's starting to sound like what? It's starting to sound like Nazi Germany. That's not what we do as a people. That's certainly not what our Lord has taught us. And Jochebed in the Old Testament, she has an opportunity to just look the other way to have the baby and let him go. It would have been easier for her. But she chooses courageously to keep her child. And so the question we need to ask herself is... Are we going to be the kind of people that are like Jochebed? Are mothers in this nation going to choose their children to be equal or above their careers? Or are they going to just go after their own comfort and desires? We know that women, my wife is a full-time career woman. I support that. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing. She's ten times the worker I am. But she still prioritizes our children first and makes sure that's met. Jochebed was a courageous mother. Second of all, Jochebed was a mother with godly wisdom. Verse 3. But when she could not hide him any longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. She placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. And his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe. The attendants were walking along. They saw it. They brought it to her. She opened it. She saw it was crying, felt sorry for it. This is one of the Hebrew babies. And then the sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and, and have one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? I think when we look at this part of the passage, we see that Jochebed was like God in the fact that she was wise. We see that she was courageous. Joshua 1.9 says, be bold and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you. She was courageous. But she was also wise like God. She thought ahead, how do I beat this system? How do I preserve my son's life? How do I do that? Now, to put it in bigger perspective, guess what? Moses was her third kid. It would have been easy to let him go. She already had a boy and she already had a girl. Miriam's probably like a preteen or a teen. And we know from Exodus 7, 7 that Aaron is three years older than Moses. So he's three. She's already got one of each. Why not just let this guy go? But she knew that was wrong. She knew that was evil and she loved her son. And so she comes up with this masterful plan. I've often thought, what would you do if you were told that your son was going to be slaughtered. You sit and you think and you process and you beg and you pray and you ask God, Lord, show me what I got to do. How do I save my son? What do I got to do to beat this? And the Lord gives her wisdom. She makes a little ark. We told you that, right? That the word used for the basket, the only other time it's used in the, New, in the Old Testament or in the Bible is for Noah's ark. It's surrounded by pitch, and it's surrounded by this stuff, and now it's going to be able to float. But guess what? Guess where it's going? It's floated among the what? What does it say? It floated among the banks of the Nile in the what? The reeds. <coughs> How much of time have you spent down on the river among the weeds and the reeds? That's where the animals hang out. Have you ever thought about this? So I was looking this up a few days ago and researching this. On the Nile River, what kind of animals do you find in the reeds? Guess what one of the primary animals you find in the reeds is? 
the African crocodile, the largest predator in the Nile River, looking for someone or something to eat. Ooh. Guess what else you find among the reeds of the Nile? Poisonous water snakes. Ugh, you know how I hate snakes. I'll take the crocodiles. But this woman figures out, I'm going to put them in this ark. I'm going to coat it. It'll be a little bit of a sound barrier. I'm going to put it among the reeds where he'll be hidden. It'll muffle his sound. And I'm going to give him an overseer, right? Big sister Miriam. Now, Miriam just isn't here. She's later on one of the leaders of Israel, along with the brother Aaron, the priest, and along with Moses. She's right there with Moses in the thick of things. We see Miriam on the scene a lot. She obviously is a godly young lady. And so in her wisdom, Jochebed puts this baby in a certain place where she doesn't think it'll be found. Has Miriam over him. And you know, by night you wouldn't have to do that. Just during the day you'd have to hide him in the reeds. Then at night you'd snatch him back out and take him home and nobody would probably hear among all the stuff going on in the homes, the baby. But then the next day, right back out in the reeds. You ever think about how Jochebed... She agonized over putting her baby out there. You ever think about Miriam's tough babysitting duty? You ever did babysitting where, you know, you had the kid from hell? You ever did that? Any of you ladies? The babysitter, you know, a kid from hell? I dated this girl once in high school that, that she was watching these three kids, and, and she shouldn't have been doing this, but I was calling her, and she was on her phone, and she was talking to me. And while she was talking to me, I'm bad, I admit it. Okay, I shouldn't have talked to her while she babysit. But while she was talking to me, she went outside to look where they're at. They went in behind her, closed the door, and locked it with the deadbolts, locked her out. Right? The kids from hell. Talk about tough babysitting duty. Miriam's among the crocodiles and the snakes and the reeds. This is tough stuff, right? Yet God takes that wisdom a little bit further. Because in God's wisdom, he providentially places a woman among those reeds to bathe. And that woman among those reeds to bathe is going to have a heart that has been softened by God, that's going to be prepared by God to have mercy to save a Hebrew boy and go against her father's command. And that's Pharaoh's daughter. There's the wisdom of Jacob and there's the wisdom of God that providentially places Pharaoh's daughter in just the right place at just the right time that when Miriam brought him out and put him among the reeds, guess what? she would find him, and she would have mercy on him. And so the very Pharaoh that said that the baby boys will be sacrificed to the Nile God, the Nile and Pharaoh's own household, in a great reversal by God's power and providence, saves the entire nation from genocide. Jochebed's courage and her wisdom led to Moses surviving. And God in all his wisdom, he put the right people in the right place at the right time to save Moses. That's why the scriptures say in Jeremiah 10, 12, but God made the earth by his power. He founded the world by his wisdom and he stretched out the heavens by his understanding. Our God is an all wise God. Earlier I had a discussion with a woman in this congregation, a wise woman, about how we don't always understand the ways of God. Is that true? Or am I the only one floating out there alone? Sometimes I go, do you ever have this conversation? Lord, what are you doing? Come on. I don't get this. I want to be obedient. I want to be in the center of your plan, but I don't understand. And this is painful. And this looks really bad. And sometimes we're in the midst of that, and we have to fall back on the fact that we have an all-wise God and we need to trust him. And that woman in my discussion was about how even in the pain, even in the sorrow, even in the difficulties and what looks really, really bad and traumatic, God's got a plan. That he works together all things for good for those who are called according to his purpose, right? Who love him, the way that Romans 8 says. We need to lean upon the everlasting arms of Jesus and trust in his wisdom. Amen? We should. Jochebed, excuse me, Jochebed did that. She's what all good mothers do. She has wisdom for daily living and a heavenly wisdom. And you get that by being in prayer and in God's word. Jochebed did this, right? With what she knew, she wouldn't have a Bible like you and I. She wouldn't have this. 
Moses hadn't written the very book that we're in yet, right? He's not an adult yet. But she had the oral tradition and she had the stories of Abraham and Mother Sarah, right? The great patriarch and her faith in God. And Jacob and Rachel and Isaac and, and all those things. Rebecca, all those people. And she would have known those things. And she would have known that you turn to God. And James 1.5 says, If anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously all without finding fault, and it will be given to him or her, right? But when they ask, they must believe and not doubt. James 1.5. Jochebed was one of those women that was courageous, and she was wise. And you can see her, like all good mothers, on her knees, crying out to Yahweh Almighty for his mercy and his grace to save her child and her family. Seeking his face through wisdom. Is it any different today? Are mothers any different? Ladies, are you any different than that today? When you're up against the wall and you got nothing left, do you not find yourself on your knees talking to God? It was because my mother was living on her knees in her bedroom, crying for me and my brothers that we're still around. And that's no lie. There was a deep, dark part of my life I've talked about. And during that time, my mom shepherded me through that time spiritually, not by coming and giving me advice because I didn't want to hear it, but by being on her knees and crying out to God. I would come home from college and I would see her and hear her. She didn't know I'd come in the house. I'd sneak in the back door and I would see her on her knees crying out tears for me. That God would save me from what I was going through. That he would turn me back to him. And she literally saved my life. By seeking his face and seeking his wisdom. Ecclesiastes 2.16 teaches us the person who pleases God. God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. As the women of this church, are we any different? We should be an asking group. And men, we should follow the suit of the mothers. I wish that I had the prayer life of my wife or some of the women in this church today. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Lastly, I want us to see that Jacob was a mother with a living, active faith, right? In verses 8 through 10, it kind of talks a little bit about that. Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. Pharaoh's daughter's talking to who? To the real mother, Jochebed, right? Not only are you getting your kid back, but you're not only going to get to nurse him, but you're going to get what? You're going to get paid. You're going to get a government stipend for it. This is perfect, right? So the woman took the baby, that's Jochebed, and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Jochebed was a mother with a living, active faith. She believed in the providential protection and provision of Almighty God. The amazing reversal of a fortune. She must have said to God in the privacy of her home, wow, I prayed for this. I talked to you and look at this. Not only did I, my son get saved, but he's been put back in my arms. And what do you think she's going to do as she nursed him? Now, women in the ancient world, the ancient Near East, they didn't nurse for six months like we do now or a year. Often they would nurse for five or six years. I see some women rolling their eyes. What? In certain Asian cultures, they will nurse till they're eight years old sometimes. Wow. So let's say he was nursed till he was three or four or five or whatever. What do you think Jacob was doing while she was nursing him and spending time with him, mothering him? She was teaching him the Hebrew faith. She was teaching him about the God of Isaac and Jacob and, and Abraham. How do we know that that's probably true? How do we know that? We've already looked at when Moses, just last week, went to the burning bush. And he says, who are you? Who is it that's, who's sending me? How do I tell my people that God is sending me? What is your name? And God said, I am that I am, the great I am, right? And then he says what? I am the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And guess what? Moses took that as him being God. How did he do that? Unless he was introduced to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by none other than Jochebed. Pharaoh's daughter didn't teach him that. 
She taught him about false gods the rest of his life. But Jochebed had taught him about God. With her great faith, she had moved it on to her son. Hebrews 11.1, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. Does that sound like this incidence of Jochebed? Do you think that she had faith when she put her child in that little bitty ark and sent him on the Nile among, among all those animals, among the reeds? Do you think that she had an act of living faith? Yes. Do you think that she had an act of living faith when she went against Egypt and against Pharaoh to hide the child that could cost her and her family, her husband, and all her kids their lives? It wasn't just her own head and neck on the line. In the ancient world, you disobeyed. I don't just kill you. I kill your entire family so you guys get the point. And so does everybody else. She had a living and active faith I can see her praying to God on a regular basis. I can hear hear her reciting to Moses what she knew from the ancient fathers of their faith. As she nursed him, as she rocked him, as she loved him, as she taught him, as she kind of stopped the bleeding of his skin knee as a toddler and all those things, she did those things teaching him about the great God, Yahweh. Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he, that's God, rewards those who seek him. Jochebed sought God. She believed in God. She relied upon God. She had faith in God. And did God reward her? Yes, he did. Does it work any different today? The book of Hebrews says very clearly that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The same God then is the same God that we worship today, amen? He works the same way today. She was courageous. She was wise, and she had an active, powerful faith. As a woman, as a mother, she had deep faith in God, mighty power, And all God's goodness she relied upon. How do we know this? Hebrews 11 tells us this. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw that he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Her faith is permanently enshrined in the faith hall of fame in Hebrews 11 with all the greats, Moses and Abraham and everything. And there's Jochebed and Amram right there with him. God put her name, so to speak, in lights. Hebrews eleven twenty three. You want to be seen and known by God? You want his providential provision and protection, his favor for your life? As a woman, be a mother of faith. Be a woman of courage. Be wise, right? And how do we do that in today's world? We become people of the word. We become people of prayer. Women of the word are powerful. Women of prayer are powerful. They change the face of the world. One mother, Susanna Wesley, prayed for her kids, taught them the Beatitudes, made them memorize the Ten Commandments, the Beatitudes, the Lord's Prayer, and taught them and discipled them and loved them and prayed for them and kept at it and kept at it and kept at it as she has a deadbeat minister husband that wasn't around. And two of her sons, John and Charles, became two of the greatest in church history. Charles wrote 4,000 hymns. Most of the hymns you sing today that weren't by Franny Crosby were written by him. If they weren't Isaac Watts or Franny Crosby, he's the, the, the birth of those. He's the originator of most of those. And John Wesley totally changed the face of England. Preached 58,000 sermons on horseback with no PA system out in the open, to miners, to farmers, to to ranchers, to simple people. And they came to Christ, they repented of their sins, they put their faith in Jesus, and it transformed England into a Christian nation in a great awakening. And he was so good at it, he left England and came to the United States, and he didn't do a good job in the United States, but one of his disciples, Asbury, became the one who planted most of the Methodist churches in the eastern part of the United States and a seminary is named after him. That's the power of a woman of the word and a woman of prayer that disciples, that actively teaches her children the faith of God. It worked for Jacob. Look at what Moses became, a priest for his people. 
it will work for you today also. Now you may think that the culture has the most say with your kids, but most teens that I talk to, most young people I've counseled say their mom has the most influence on them. I kind of wish they'd say their dad did, but that's not what I hear. It's just not. NFL players always say what? Thank you, mom. You very rel- seldom say thank you, dad. I mean, we got short in the stick. You know, I don't know what we're doing wrong. We'll talk about that on Father's Day. No, just kidding. <laughs> 2 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing, right? Pray without ceasing. That's the kind of people we should be as mothers. What about singing? As you sing hymns of the faith, as you sing this song, Thank You Jesus, that we sung this morning, actually I picked, and I, I heard it for the first time at a men's conference that I went to a pastor's conference a few weeks ago, about a month, and, and it was sung by a group of women And it just captivated 12,000 men to where 12,000 men were singing after four women. 12,000 men lifting up their voices singing, thank you, Jesus, for what he had done. That's the power of women. That's the power that you have. My mom used to sing in the garden in Amazing Grace all the time. And to this day, I have those lyrics memorized in my head. Do you not think that at deep, dark times in my life, that I didn't fall back on that, because I did. The scripture that my mom had me memorize, Psalm 23, Psalm 100, John 3, 16, and others, I still remember those scriptures best today. Not just what I learned in children's church, but what my mom taught me. And though she's been gone for five going on six years, her Bible that she discipled me with, as you walk into my house, it sits in a pr- place of pride of place right in the entryway in my living room. When my brother said, what do you want of mom's stuff? I said, I want her Bible. And inside that Bible, as you open it up, are all the highlights. And guess what I found about four weeks ago as I was going back through it? She kept a bookmark that I made her in Sunday school in third grade. A picture of a little blue bird on a tree, you know, total pastoral, idyllic kind of Bible thing, you know, Sunday school and all that. Had Ephesians 6.4 is the memory verse that I wrote on that. My mom kept that in her Bible to the day she died at 70. Do you not think that that has an impact on me? My mom told me, one day you will be a man of God and you will be a preacher. And I told her, you're insane. I'm a shrink. I don't want to do that stuff. She said, you're a shrink now. But God's told me something different. She knew God well, and she knew what was coming. That's the power of a mother in your life. Jochebed was courageous. She was wise, and she was active in her faith. So how do we close this? It's called Jochebed to Jesus, right, in the title? So far, what's going on with Jesus? Well, this is what's going on with Jesus. I alluded to it earlier. Jochebed's courage, wisdom, and faith. By saving Moses, Moses went on to the burning bush of Exodus 3 that we looked at and meets Almighty God. And God calls him to be his spokesman and his deliverer. And he goes to the most powerful man on the earth, Pharaoh, and he says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says what? He says, no, get lost, go pound sand. And God, through Moses, the ten plagues, Finally, in the great reversal of fortune, where Moses was originally sentenced to death by Pharaoh, instead God takes Pharaoh's firstborn son as judgment on him. And he lets the Israelites go, probably a million people. And not only that, but they plunder. God commands them, plunder the Egyptians. And they take all the fine things. And they even take some Egyptians with them that are believers. And they wander out into the desert. And Moses leads them to the promised land that Joshua eventually takes them over the the river Jordan into the promised land that is today Israel. But Moses was the great deliverer. He's the one that went up on Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments that you and I still use today. Moses was the great lawgiver. He was the great priest in the tabernacle. He began the tabernacle that went on to become the temple that has gone on to be churched for us today. He saved the nation of Israel, and eventually the Israelites produced a little-known baby 
in a little town of Bethlehem that Herod said all the baby boys should be killed in too. Does that sound familiar? Like anything we just read? And just as Moses had salvation through Egypt by God's powerful hand, Jesus was saved from judgment of Herod in a dream by being told his parents to flee to where? To Egypt. And he went to Egypt and they waited till Herod died. And then he comes back for his great ministry. His life, his teaching, his modelness, his perfection in life, and eventually his being our substitute in our place, dying for our sins on the cross, paying the penalty for your sins and mine, and giving us his righteousness. If it wasn't for Jochebed's obedience, there is no Jesus Christ, and there is no reason we would gather here today on this Mother's Day to worship his name and say, thank you, Jesus. It is from Jochebed to Jesus, through her courage, through her wisdom, and through her act of faith. And women today are the same, and I am so grateful for you ladies. The impact that you've had on my children and still do. Miss Coleman has a powerful impact on my children. Miss Meg has a powerful impact. One of the most powerful impacting people on my daughter Kayla right now is Miss Meg and her discipleship of her. I worship God for the other women in this church that are great models to my daughters and bless my children. You're not just mothering your own kids, you're mothering other people's kids too. You don't have one Christian mother in this family of God. You have multiple, amen? You people are so good to my kids. You backfill all the mistakes that I make, and that is the truth. Okay, and I worship God for that all the time. On this Mother's Day, I'm not only thankful for you, but I'm thankful for mothers that have gone before you, obedient to Jesus Christ, right? This morning, I think we don't need to have an invitation that we normally do. I think the invitation that we have is just to stay right where we're at. We're going to sing and do what we normally do. I'm going to ask the, the group to go ahead and come on forward to do that. But as they sing, what I want you to do this morning is just in the, in the place where you're sitting, just where God has you, think about how you can be more like Jacobit as a woman. As a man, how do we support the women in our lives? We have a role in great mothers, not making them, but supporting them. As men, we need to ask ourselves, the mothers in our lives, our own mothers, our wives and our mothers, other people's mothers, how do we support them? Do we do a good job at that? Sometimes the answer is, no, and we need to step up to the plate, right? What says love to a woman more than doing the dishes, making the bed, and making sure the oil in the car is changed, right? How many women hate those things? Yeah, that's what I thought, right? Every woman needs an extra hand. They're carrying so many things. As men, we can be a bigger piece of that, okay? So as we sing and as we do those things, I want you to just think about God, how can I be more like Jacobit as a woman? And as a man, how can I support the women in my life, okay? Let's go ahead and stand and you can lead us.